Hello everyone, thank you again for checking out my videos as always. This is a continuance of the first video, Definitive Proof of Evolution, in which I discussed Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA, our chromosomal fusion, and endogenous retroviruses. Now let me start by saying that a couple of you commented on the title Definitive Proof of Evolution and pointed out the fact that proof applies only to mathematics, and you are 100% correct. However, I use this solely because the people who know the distinction and are aware of it already accept evolution anyways. Um, furthermore, creationists often harp on scientists for using any kind of qualifier, so I decided to go with the forceful language, because, quite frankly, to the target audience, it implies the meaning that I intend to convey. And But yes, you are absolutely correct, I understand the distinction, however, it serves this purpose well. Now, as I'll explain in greater detail later on, summation is essentially the fact that evolution truly unites all the disciplines, that is, you can take information learned from embryology, comparative anatomy, genetics, molecular biology, virtually anything like that, even paleontology, and it is confirmed by evolution. It makes many predictions so that things in one field can be verified and applied to research in another field, which is also coincidentally why evolution is just so valuable. So it's the, the summation of all these individual aspects, all these individual disciplines, and the ability to convert information, which is what's termed summation, that is truly the strongest piece of evolution. And I'll give you some examples. Let me start by showing you the phylogenetic tree. This is essentially the tree of life. It is the backbone of evolution and shows what organisms descended from what and where commonalities should lie. Um, this is where evolution gets its main test. Take a look at it. This is the tree of life, and these can be developed from absolutely any discipline. You can take an embryological um, assessment of all the organisms and construct a tree of life based on their evolution from there. You can do the same thing with genetics. You can do the same thing with comparative anatomy. They all make phylogenetic trees, including with the fossil record, and what do you know, they all line up from there. I'll demonstrate that later on. And the odds of basically all of these phylogenetic trees containing thousands of organisms all being incorrect and matching up perfectly incorrectly is ludicrous. So let's start with a phylogenetic analysis of embryology and the data that can be gained from that. Now, all organisms pass through stages which are characteristic of their predecessors. Um, this is influenced, or this is evidenced rather, by humans having gill slits, pharyngeal gill slits, um, looking identical to prior stages of life that we evolved from, in addition to the fact that we have a tail during embryological development, and in fact some babies are still born with tails. Um, this is also a way that evolution can be tested. For example, find a non-mammalian that has nipples during development. You simply won't find it. Now, we can take the characteristics that we see during embryology and construct a phylogenetic tree of it to see exactly how life could have evolved based on the way that an organism develops. And there are many factors here which I simply don't have time to get into, such as um, whether something is a protostome or a deuterostome, the symmetry, things like that. If you're familiar with biology, you understand what I'm talking about, and you understand how powerful these diagnostic characters are in developing a phylogenetic tree. But simply know and take away from this that organisms develop in a very specific way and from this you can construct a very precise phylogenetic tree so this is what it looks like now let's construct a phylogenetic tree from comparative anatomy that is comparing the physical structures and anatomical structures of one organism to another to determine homologies and to see if they're similar um, we can construct a phylogenetic tree from comparative anatomy as well, which is a completely different field of biology. This is where the evolution come, becoming the unifying theory of biology comes into play. Now, it's long been known that if you take the, the bones of your hand, the, bo the bones of a bat wing, the, the bones in a basically any kind of hoof, you will see exactly what's going on. They are the same bones in the same places, just in different ratios. This is actually what I did some of my undergraduate research on was um, BMP4, which is essentially a protein that, during development, expresses and changes all of the um, actual physical characteristics of the bones in the sense of their length and things like that. And subtle expression can create vast differences, as you'll see like this. The bones are completely homologous in a lot of situations, and as shown in the middle ear of evolving whales, which I'll get to later, but you can see that as well. So, if we were to take a phylogenetic tree based solely on comparative anatomy, that is, from the anatomical structures that we see in many different organisms of different um, uh, kingdoms and whatnot, they all line up and make this phylogenetic tree here. Notice that it's identical to the one created independently by embryology. 
Now let's take a completely different field from embryology and comparative anatomy, let's take genetics and create a phylogenetic tree from it. Um, something very important to understand about genetics is that it truly is one of the biggest and strongest pieces of evidence for evolution. Um, check it yourself. Anything that I'm about to tell you, go to PubMed.com, which is where any serious scientist goes to do their nucleotide sequences or anything like that, because it contains the DNA of virtually every organism. Now, what you can do is take any of the thousands and thousands of genes in our bodies, pick one at random, go to PubMed, check out the sequences of it. I'm about to show you some for cytochrome C and others and it lines up perfectly with what evolution says. Compare it to organisms that we should be descendants of, and compare it to those who are on a separate terminal branch of another, or of the um, phylogenetic tree as well. Test it yourself. And we could literally make thousands of phylogenetic trees based on each gene in our genome, and they would all line up perfectly with what evolution says. But let's simplify it and only make one based on genetics. Now note that this also completely coincides with endogenous retroviruses, which I touched on in my last video. Their location, as, long as, uh, or as well as the location of virtually every other gene that we have, corresponds perfectly to what evolution would predict. Now let's move along to any metabolic pathway, which is the same thing um, that you can study evolutionarily. It relates heavily to genetics, but different bacteria especially um, metabolize different chemicals in a certain way. Um, from that, we can identify the organism. Um, it's the same thing, have you ever used a field guide, which, you know, does the plant have two leaves or three? If three, turn to page seven and yada yada. Basically taking characteristics and if yes, no, go different routes, and you can identify the organism. All that is based upon common descent and would be completely false if evolution were um, not true. You wouldn't be able to identify anything. Um, same thing with me personally. When I have a patient with an infection that I can't find out what's causing it, I send it off for 16S typing, which essentially they analyze the sequence, like you've just done in the genetics portion, of the organism that's causing the problem, and they can place it perfectly on the phylogenetic tree where it belongs and identify it based on the sequence. This is just another perfect example of evolution having a practical function. It unites all the disciplines as well as has useful applications in medicine and other fields. Now if evolution were false, the result would be meaningless and my treatment would more likely harm the patient. However, as it turns out, this ends up helping and it can save lives. Now let's move on to the fossil record. We can make certain predictions from the fossil record as to how things evolved and cre can create a phylogenetic tree um, from that as well. For example, we would predict based on evolution that we will never find a half bird, half mammal transitional form. And we don't. Why? Because that would fly in the face of evolution. We can also predict that we would never find a poodle from the Permian era, which, again, we don't find, because those organisms evolved later. The fossil record corresponds perfectly to evolution, with more primitive organisms typically on the bottom, and, in general, more complex, appearing towards upper strata. And again, I'm talking about strata, not relative depth, which is something that creationists often confuse. Um, again, also supporting evolution, aside from the hundreds of transitional fossils that we have, and I'll make another video on this, is the fact that where we find those fossils geographically conforms perfectly to evolution as well. For example, evolution states that um, some of the complex mammals were the last to evolve. So, for example, we shouldn't find them on islands such as Australia. You will never find a fossil of an elephant in Australia. That would fly in the face of evolution. So we can construct a completely independent phylogenetic tree based solely on the fossil record, and it'll correspond perfectly to the other phylogenetic trees that evolution predicts. So now let's tie absolutely everything together. Let's take the independent phylogenetic trees assembled from all the disciplines in biology. Um, cell biology, the fossil record, genetics, geography, um, field guides, embryology, the phylogenetic tree as a whole, including comparative anatomy, which didn't use any of the other um, features, tie them all together and line them up, and they line up completely seamlessly. Note that this is equivalent to basically taking a jigsaw puzzle the size of the earth, having all the pieces fit perfectly, having it make a nice pretty picture without any um, seams whatsoever, and having it be put together the wrong way. And it's not just the major disciplines that line up seamlessly, there are literally millions of other tiny aspects in biology, which is why the more that you know, the more likely you are to accept evolution, such as the different types of immune cells, to what type of collagen cells have, to skin, retinal cells, changes in ion channels. Through things like these in the micro-disciplines, there are literally millions of pieces of evidence independently supporting evolution perfectly.